Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is the difference between primary and secondary psychopathy? If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. That way you won't miss anything new. Now we talk about the construct of psychopathy. We are talking about a construct that is fairly similar to the mental disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and we see this in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And actually, psychopathy is similar to all of the cluster B personality disorders. So antisocial, narcissistic, and to a lesser extent, it's associated with borderline and histrionic personality disorders. So the way we could think of these two constructs, psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder, would be that antisocial personality disorder is defined mostly based on behaviors. And psychopathy is defined partially on behaviors, but it also adds this interpersonal component. So the way these two constructs are measured is a bit different, and the way they're used in the research is a bit different. Usually the way we think about them is that most everyone who has psychopathy would also qualify for antisocial personality disorder. Not all, but most. But only some individuals with antisocial personality disorder would also qualify as having psychopathy. Now when we look at the construct of psychopathy a little more closely, we see that it can be divided into two major types. And that's what I'm really talking about here in today's video, primary versus secondary psychopathy. Now a lot of times with primary psychopathy, this term can be synonymous with the term psychopathy. So a lot of times when individuals in research say psychopathy, they really mean primary psychopathy. Secondary psychopathy is sometimes referred to as sociopathy. Now this term sociopathy is not very common in the research literature anymore, but it really does have the strongest relationship with this construct of secondary psychopathy. So this can become a bit confusing because when you hear the term psychopathy, it's not really clear if it's referring to the entire construct or just primary psychopathy. And additionally, sometimes when individuals use sociopathy, they're really talking about psychopathy as opposed to just secondary psychopathy. So there's a lot of confusion around these terms, psychopathy, sociopathy, primary and secondary psychopathy, and their usage. So it's important to really understand the distinctions between them. So when we look at primary psychopathy, we know there are certain characteristics associated with it. Being unemotional, callous, manipulative, calculating, having little or no fear, guilt, remorse, empathy, or anxiety. We also tend to think of primary psychopathy as having an etiology, that is, it's caused by genetic influences more so than environmental influences. Also, psychopathy has a fairly strong association with antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. Now, when we talk about secondary psychopathy or sociopathy, we see a different set of characteristics. Sometimes secondary psychopathy is referred to by this term antisocial deviance. So really secondary psychopathy is more associated with criminal behavior than is primary psychopathy. We also see a number of other characteristics like being rash, impulsive, emotional, anxious, hostile, aggressive, volatile, and self-destructive. Individuals with secondary psychopathy also tend to be more disorganized and tend to have a risky decision-making style when compared to individuals with primary psychopathy. Now, in terms of the experience of fear and remorse, individuals with secondary psychopathy can experience those emotions more so than we see with primary psychopathy. But experiencing emotions with secondary psychopathy is really related to emotional dysregulation. There's a lot of difficulty managing emotions with secondary psychopathy. We don't really see that with primary psychopathy. Now, as I mentioned, when we think of primary psychopathy, in terms of etiology, we often think of a genetic etiology, genetic causes. With secondary psychopathy, we tend to think that the etiology is based more in the environment. So generally, we would say that individuals with primary psychopathy were born that way, and individuals with secondary psychopathy develop these different characteristics because of environmental stressors. Now, secondary psychopathy also has a fairly strong relationship to antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. But the interesting relationship here that separates it from primary psychopathy is that an individual with secondary psychopathy is more likely to meet the full criteria for borderline personality disorder than an individual with primary psychopathy. Another way we can think of this difference between primary and secondary psychopathy 
is around the ability to experience emotions. With primary psychopathy, we see an emotional deficit. Individuals, again, have difficulty experiencing fear, remorse, and some would argue even feeling love. With secondary psychopathy, it's more of an emotional disturbance. So it's really deficit versus disturbance. Another interesting area where we can draw a distinction between primary and secondary psychopathy is the area of empathy. And there's been a lot of research on empathy as it relates to psychopathy. One of the interesting findings here is that cognitive empathy, the ability to understand the emotions of other people, is intact with both primary and secondary psychopathy. The difference really becomes around this construct of affective empathy, being able to feel what someone else feels. Now again, when we conceptualize primary psychopathy, we look at this term as having an association with an inability to experience emotions, so it would make sense that affective empathy would be decreased. But interestingly, there are two different theories with primary psychopathy. The one theory is that there is no empathy, as I mentioned, so affective empathy is compromised. But the other theory is there is no concern. So the affective empathy is in place, but individuals with primary psychopathy don't have a concern around how people feel. So there are two different theories there, and we really don't have a clear idea of which one is correct, or there may be another theory that explains how empathy works that we don't know about yet. Now, with secondary psychopathy, it's a little different in terms of affective empathy. Here, we believe that individuals with secondary psychopathy do have the ability to empathize affectively. However, emotional dysregulation interferes with the use of that ability. So when they try to use their empathy skills, their affective empathy skills, they end up demonstrating emotions of their own, like hostility and aggression. And this gets in the way of experiencing that empathy. Even though we draw a number of distinctions between primary and secondary psychopathy, it's important to remember that all of these characteristics do appear on a continuum. Now often, psychopathy is treated as one construct, but really some of the characteristics are quite different, particularly at the extremes where we can clearly distinguish primary from secondary psychopathy. So when treating or studying psychopathy, it's important we keep the differences between primary and secondary psychopathy in mind. I hope you found this description of primary and secondary psychopathy to be interesting. Thanks for watching.